Okay, sir. Good evening and welcome to one and all. Myself, Rupsha from Clearnet, the designated session assistant for a seamless experience of the session. Clearnet is very proud to be a digital partner of this event organized by Society of Onco Anesthesia and Perioperative Care. And the topic of today's session is pain in cancer survivors. Clearnet is India's most trusted and widely used digital platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for doctors. So let's begin today's session for which I would like to invite Dr. Garg, sir. Over to you, sir. Kindly proceed with your talk. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction, uh, sir. So we are moving towards the uh, uh, SOPSI program, SOPSI webinar, which is quite popular, uh, taken by Society of Hong Kong and Palliative Care. And we are moving to yet a uh, very, very important topic in this uh, webinar series, and that is the pain in cancer survivors. And I will request uh, uh, Dr. R.P. Gedu to take it forward, who will be the chairperson for uh, today's webinar. And we all know uh, Sir very well. I think his CV is so big and uh, we know him so well. Maybe I'll take any time, much time to introduce. He is professor in anesthesia and head of pain medicine department at D.Y. Patel. Medical College at Navi Mumbai. He has been examiner for many of us. He has enormous number of presentations and we have been learning from him by listening to his sessions. He is past secretary and president of ISSP. He is editor for many books, many chapters in the books. He's a prolific speaker at various national and international uh, conferences. He's the convener for pain medicine fellowship by National Board of Examination and Medical Sciences. And he is uh, definitely a member of many of the, uh, I told the board of uh, reputed journals, many publications. And uh, he has been exclusively doing in a lot of work in pain and palliative management, also in airways. So I would request, I think he's the best person to introduce the speaker and the topic today. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Of course, I know him also very well. After all, he is my boss. I can say that. So let me introduce Aparna Chatterjee. Actually, I must say that I am lucky and blessed also that I had an opportunity to work with Aparna also. Almost, I can say, 14, 15 years. Uh, and uh, I know her. She's a well-dedicated pain physician also and well-dedicated anesthetist. I, had a, I was lucky enough to work with her. And I have seen her commitment also towards the pain and palliative care also. So I think uh, she has also been very much academician. So I think let us start with uh, Aparna Chatterjee. Aparna, you can start. Thank you so much indeed, Dr. Gerdo. Thank you so much indeed. It was a, for your very kind in, uh, introduction. I mean, I am nowhere as compared to what you are in the field of pain, certainly. And uh, thank you so much indeed. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, let me start my talk. Uh, today, today my talk is on pain and cancer survivors. This is one of the three talks that we've had on cancer pain. Okay, the first one was on uh, pain because of the disease itself. The second one was pain because of the treatment. And now today we are talking about cancer survivors. Why do we need to talk about cancer survivors? Yeah, uh, oncology has uh, over the years uh, progressed to such an extent that uh, there are uh, patients are diagnosed much earlier. They are treated much earlier. There are several lines of chemotherapy as well as immunotherapy and other mechanisms by which patients can be treated. Um, also, surgery itself has advanced. There are other interventional procedures as well. So things which were previously um, considered, patients who were considered to be inoperable and uh, advanced are now treated even with multivisceral surgeries. So basically, survivorship in cancer has increased tremendously over the last 20, 25 years especially in the West where it is known that more than two third of the population who's diagnosed with cancer actually survive for at least five years. Okay, so, but one big problem about this survivorship is that all these patients have undergone a whole lot of treatment during their disease phase. And so naturally, a significant number of patients would 
heart pain in the post operative uh, post uh, treatment phase when they are free of the disease or uh, free of the disease and uh, that makes pain a very large burden in patients who are survivors. In fact, evidence suggests that the prevalence of pain is almost 40% in this survivor population. So this is the article which was published in NEJM way back in 2018, which clearly shows the increase in the number of survivors. And they uh, attributed a good 26.1 million survivors by the end of 2040. Even at present, we have several million who are surviving after treatment with cancer, uh, can, treatment of cancer. First and foremost, let's decide what is a, let's define survivor. There are various organizations which have got a, uh, they have different ways of defining a survivor, like the NCCN guidelines define a survivor as somebody from the time of diagnosis to the entire course of treatment and even living some, someone living with and beyond cancer. Whereas the EORTC group describes a survivor as somebody who has been treated and after his primary or her primary treatment is now cancer free and there's no evidence of any active disease. So for all practical purposes, we define survivors as those who are not only free of disease, but also those who are living with cancer as a chronic disease. Okay, why do I say chronic? There are certain cancers, especially metastatic breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, my, multiple myeloma, and even chronic myeloid leukemia, especially the first three. Uh, all these cancers are slow growing, can very well be controlled with intermittent epi uh, treatment with chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and so on. And these patients can survive for as long as 10, sometimes even more number of years. Uh, and can have a fun fully functional life. Okay, so they are in them, the disease is, cancer is more like a chronic illness, such as hypertension, diabetes, hypothyroidism, and so on. So they are practically living with this disease. So what causes pain in cancer survivors? Yes, you've heard about pain because of the disease, pain because of the treatment. Okay, but what about cancer survivors? Yes. Cancer survivors can have pain which is of non-cancer origin, certainly. Because I will come to that later. They tend to have a greater predisposition to non-cancer pain. But, whoops, there's the picture, sorry. But the most common causes of pain in cancer are, uh, cancer survivors is the same treatment-related pain which persists in the survivorship of this patient. So they tend to have chronic post-surgical pain, radiation-induced pain, neuropathies, tumor effects as well, and musculoskeletal pain. So the pain which you have already learned about as treatment-induced pain also persists into a in a large proportion of patients way into their survivorship. So let's do each and every one of them and go through each. Okay, now looking at chronic persistent surgery, uh, post-operative pain, okay, chronic pain due to persistence post-surgical pain. Now, what is post-surgical pain? You've already heard in the second lecture, Dr. Afrin Siddiqui had explained about post-surgical pain. This is treatment-related pain, usually occurs immediately after the surgery. See, it is seen also in non-cancer surgeries, but less likely than in cancer surgeries, which are more extensive, requiring extensive dissection, radical excisions, nerve cuttings, and so on. It's a more of a neuropathic type of pain, which is localized to the area of the surgery or into a territory where it's referred to, the pain referred to. So patients tend to have hypo or hyperalgesia, allodynia, pricking, burning sensations. And remember one thing, when a cancer patient, even after cure of cancer, they've had any pain symptoms, then the patient's main fear is the cancer coming back. So that affects their function, their day-to-day -day life, as well as their quality of life. Most common causes of uh, post-surgical pain is following surgery for the breast, like post-mastectomy pain. In our own center, at Tata Memorial Center, we have found an incidence of as high as 35.8% at six months following surgery. And we haven't followed these patients beyond. Many of them are disease-free. And I'm sure a large proportion, there is enough evidence in literature to tell you that it can go on for two years, three years, depending upon, I mean, it varies from patient to patient. 
even post thoracotomy pain lingers on radical prostatectomy and nephrectomy are also known to cause persistent pain tumor effects uh yes in those patients in whom cancer becomes a chronic disease tumor is the one of the causes for the pain and this is seen in metastatic breast metastatic prostate cancers and multiple myelomas and these Diseases, these cancers metastasize entirely mostly to the bone. And bone pain is one of the most debilitating of pains in the uh, in those who have these metastases. It's a constant dull background pain, and because every movement results in sudden spontaneous flare-ups and worsening of pain as well. It's a very complex entity, mainly because of extensive activity of the osteoclast. The osteoclast, once they are activated, go to the bone and destroy the bone, producing an acidic environment, which stimulates the excessive nerve fibers, which are produced over there, the nerve sprouting, which occurs because of activation of the nerve growth factor. So basically, any drug which blocks the osteoclast function is helpful in reducing the pain due to bone metastasis. So what's normally used is bisphosphonates. And of course, even denosumab, the denosumab is more very expensive. I won't go into finer details. I, I presume last week uh, on Thursday it has been covered. So then come the neuropathies. Chemotherapy is known to cause neuropathies and these neuropathies do not uh, subside with the stoppage of the chemotherapy once the patient has uh, recovered from the cancer. Many of them remain and worsen over time, especially those with taxane, who have undergone taxane chemotherapy. Chemotherapeutic agents are very toxic to the cancer cells, but they are also toxic to other cells in the body and more commonly to the neurons, especially in the dorsal root ganglion. Why? Because the dorsal root ganglion neurons are not protected by the blood-brain barrier. They are also highly vascular and then therefore they become more susceptible to injury by chemotherapeutic agents. So we get what is known as chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. This is mainly a peripheral neuropathy working ma mainly on the peripheries of the, the hands and the feet. So the, what we term as glove and stocking sort of neuropathy with tingling, burning, uh, sensation, pricking, and numbness. Many of patients have numbness, but sometimes the pain is also pretty severe. And different types of chemotherapies produce this neuropathy, such as platinum-based, oxaliplatin, cisplatin, uh, you have uh, taxanes like uh, paclitaxel, uh, vinca alkaloids, both vincristine and vinblastin also do that, and protease inhibitors like bortezomib. Platinum-based agents especially affect the hands more than the feet, and they give rise to further worsening over years, even after stoppage of the chemotherapeutic agents. And these patients develop what is known as cold-induced neuropathy. We've had patients who clearly tell you that even when they wash rice, it feels like it's burning and they're unable to do their regular cooking or cleaning or anything. Even water feels like they're putting their hands in fire. It's not only these chemotherapeutic agents, but even newer agents. The newer agents are the monoclonal antibodies, Ibs and Mabs, they also produce neuropathies. What they do normally is they activate the T cells, give rise to a whole lot of inflammation, inflammatory mediators as well as create an autoimmune effect so in effect they are creating our body's t cells to fight against those tumor cells but in effect uh, if what happens the downside of it is the auto autoimmune like activity where the t cells attack the patient's own tissues so you tend to get arthritis arthralgia myalgia myositis and so on another concept exists which is known as paraneoplastic neuropathy where uh, it is the, those patients in whom they have underlying antineuronal antibodies, the use of monoclonal antibodies probably would increase the or speed up the development of neuropathy. In patients, uh, even patients who've undergone bone marrow or stem cell transplants, what happens in this? They either undergo autogenic or allergenic. Allergenic is more common in, in other patients. Uh, stem cells are transduced into these patients. So what happens is there's always a risk of graft versus host disease. So these patients require prolonged immunosuppression. And one of the main drugs in immunosuppression is steroids. What do steroids do? They cause osteoporosis, which causes pain, 
because osteonecrosis, which also causes pain, stiffness of joints and so on. So even these patients who have undergone BMT have a high incidence of developing a pain and neuropathy. Radiation. Radiation, of course, is used for treating cancer. Radiation is also used for treating pain and cancer, especially bone pain. Radiation to the area destroys the cell, uh, cancer cells in the bone and helps minimize pain. But radiation itself can cause pain. Last week, you must have already heard about radiation-induced mucositis, which is a more acute problem, in, especially in head neck patients, upper GI patients. They have total denudation of the mucosal surface, making it very difficult for them to eat or uh, even drink water at times. Um, and it's a highly painful and distressing uh, condition. But even in long term, uh, patients can have radiation-induced pain, which can come up much later after the treatment. Okay, which ones are these such as this? This is mainly because of fibrosis. Uh, like in a patient who has undergone radiation of the chest wall for breast cancer or uh, the supraclavicular fossa, uh, depending upon the amount of the dose of the radiation, uh, they can have brachial plexopathy. And this can come much later after the treatment too. Okay. Nowadays, it has been found that uh, less than the incidence is less than two percent. If you minimize the total dose, uh, for, uh, total dose of le to less than fifty-five grays. The other condition in which you get uh, uh, radiation-induced pain is patients who have been treated for cervical cancer. Treatment of cervical cancer basically hinges on chemotherapy and radiation, not surgery, and they have a good cure rate. But the biggest problem about this is they can be fibrosis involving the lumbosacral plexus in due course. So once the patient is free of disease, it, what's, what happens is when the pain starts, they have this pain radiating from the back, low, uh, lower back down the leg. And that brings the fear of the cancer back for them. So this is one common thing. There's no disease whatsoever, but they have this pain which persists. And it's a classic neuropathic pain which has to be treated on similar lines. There's one more concept which has been confirmed by in vivo studies. Some in vivo studies which are known as radiation-induced bystander effect. Some tissues are irradiated, the others are not. But even the non-irradiated cells exhibit signs and symptoms similar to those of irradiated cells. Why? Because they have received signals from the irradiated cells. So they undergo entire process of translation, gene expression, similar to the irradiated cells as well as they end up having a, undergoing apoptosis and cell death. The fifth uh, type of pain that patients who are, uh, fifth type of pain which survivors suffer from is musculoskeletal pain. And this is seen mainly in patients who undergo treatment with aromatase inhibitors. Aromatase inhibitors are used for breast cancer. They are mainly useful for hormone sensitive breast cancer. And um, they, inhibit the synthesis of estrogens either reversibly, which are non-steroidal agents like anastrozole and letrozole, or irreversibly steroidal agents like eczemistin. So these are very effective and can be used in uh, patients for a prolonged period of time. But what happens is they cause extensive joint pains, extensive body aches, and difficulty sleeping. These patients find it so miserable. At least more than 25% of patients are known to drop out of treatment because of the pain that is created by the aromatase inhibitors. In fact, there's a syndrome which is known as aromatase inhibitor musculoskeletal syndrome, which is because of these agents. Now, the exact mechanism is not known, but there is an association of estrogen deprivation with arthritis. And this has been uh, long known, especially since uh, women postmenopausal tend to develop arthritis. And this is one of the factors for it. And uh, the other a uh, reason which could lead to this sort of pain is because of the release of inflammatory markers, which are also been shown to increase when patients are on treatment with aromatase inhibitors. Tamoxifen is the other uh, hormone therapy for breast cancer, especially those who are ERPR positive. And these patients uh, tend to be on tamoxifen for several years with a good control of their disease. This they, uh, tamoxifen has an anti-estrogen effect. So they, uh, tamoxifen too causes joint pain, not to the same extent as aromatase inhibitors, but is known to create the similar effect. 
this study, which was published in 2010, has clearly shown that in one of the studies, the incidence of arthralgia with tamoxifen is seen almost to be 30%, as opposed to anastrozole, which is just about 36%. So then tamoxifen too, in certain situations, can, I mean, can give you arthralgia. Now there's a, a condition which is known as deconditioning. This is a very complex process. It usually occurs in people who have been leading a sedentary life, bedridden for a long time, have gone through a very critical illness, and naturally cancer is a critical illness anyways. So these patients, cancer patients also can undergo deconditioning. But in de when deconditioning occurs, people tend to have a decreased mental function. They also are unable to accomplish daily activi uh, activities of daily lifestyle. They cannot do their own things. And the one thing in cancer survivors which occurs because of deconditioning is any non-cancer pain gets exacerbated. And that's why these patients tend to have a higher incidence of non-cancer chronic pain. So we all know that there are several guidelines for pain management in cancer, isn't it? Many, right from 1986 when the World Health Organization put forth the uh, ladder, the latter mainly gave us an idea how to start prescribing analgesics based on patients' pain intensity. Thereafter, there have been several guidelines put forth by several organizations and all concentrate on strong opioids as the mainstay of the analgesic therapy. This is what I normally do in patients who have cancer. But what about survivors? Can we follow the WHO ladder for survivor management? Can we use strong opioids for those patients? Survivors are a much more complex group. They are those patients who have already gone through their cancer, recovered from it, and now they want to go through, uh, go back to what their normal lifestyle was and their life was prior to the cancer diagnosis as best as they can. So when you trans administer treatment uh, for their pain, one has to take into consideration their health physical, mental, as well as the fact that their job should not be compromised. So basically, you cannot use the same guidelines for cancer survivors. In fact, long-term opioid therapy is not recommended as a first line for cancer survivors because they are just managed. If you are uh, similar, their pain is similar to that of uh, pain in non-cancer conditions. What happens if you end up giving uh, opioids to non-cancer. That is exactly what happened in the West where um, rampant administration of opioids to patients with chronic pain of non-cancer origin led to the opioid epidemic in the West. And that certainly we do not want to repeat again. So uh, opioid therapy is not acceptable as a first line in these patients who are survivors. The opioids cause a lot of side effects, constipation, nausea, vomiting, hypogonadism, mental clouding, sleep deprivation. But the main problems is abuse, misuse, and uh, diversion of the opioids to other people. Your main concern is overdose. And that is exactly what happens if these patients consume alcohol or sedatives with the opioids. Even if a patient uh, who is a cancer survivor has been on opioids towards the end of their treatment and is still on opioids, that opioid should be tapered off and patient should be chained over to other modes of treatment. The only indication, and this is also this has been mentioned by the ASCO guidelines, which I'll come to later. The only indication for long-term opioid therapy is moderate to severe treatment-related pain in survivorship not responding to your non-cancer uh, approaches, I mean, non-opioid approaches. So you have to maximally use all the non-opioid approaches, which we'll come to later. And then only if still the patient is miserable because of the pain, then one can, in this situation, administer op strong opioids, but they have to be closely monitored and they should be tapered off at the earliest. The American Society of Clinical Oncology in 2016 got together to put forth a gui evidence-based guidance for administering analgesics or pain management in patients who are cancer survivors. They did a literature search and the total number of studies that they found were at that time was 63. They, uh, there was not much high-level evidence, so most of the recommendations are based on expert consensus. 
So what did they recommend? Mainly four things. They recommended screening and comprehensive assessment treat points for treatment and care options, pharmacological interventions, and risk assessment and mitigation universal precautions if you prescribe opioids. Let's go to each and every one of them. So about screening and comprehensive assessment. So when a patient who is a cancer survivor comes to you, your first aim should be to identify the cause of the pain. It could be, rule out the presence of recurrence, rule out a second primary uh, or a second malignancy, and of course, identify if the pain is because of the late onset of the treatment effects. For that, you have to take a complete uh, assessment of the patient, in-depth understanding of their pain, any multidimensional natures of the pain, comorbid conditions, psychological assessment, any psychiatric history, prior cancer treatment, prior analgesics that they have taken, and so on. Then coming to the treatment and care options. The aim in this group is to provide comfort, improve their function, limit adverse events, and, and try to ensure safety and make sure they get back to normal function as soon as possible. It's so not only the patients, but also the caregivers who have to be involved in this treatment option. It is necessary to identify what is the patient's aim and what is their expectations, explain to them what you would want them to do, get in other professionals. The other professionals include uh, people from alternative medicine, um, uh, physiotherapy, psycho, psychiatry, psycho, clinical psychologists, and so on, all together to try to alleviate the chronic pain and improve their outcome. By other groups, it, uh, we mean uh, practitioners who deal with physical medicine, interventional therapies, psychological approaches, and uh, neurostimulatory, which includes TENS and spinal cord stimulation and so on. So ASCO recommends the use of non-pharmacological non alternative treatments also in combination with pharmacological agents, trying to get the best possible care for the patient and their recovery from the pain and getting back to their normal day-to-day -day activity. In pharma, then third point is about pharmacological interventions. Here they emphasize strictly on the use of non-opioids, basically non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, paracetamol, and the use of adjuvants. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and paracetamol work very well because many of these patients have pain which is nociceptive in origin because they may be having chronic pain which is not cancer related. I mean, not related to the cancer treatment. But however, in this set of patients, one should not administer corticosteroids just for pain. Okay, because corticosteroids themselves have a lot of side effects. What about adjuvants? The, the studies... In survivors, and especially for CIPN, there are two studies, which are RCTs both, which have clearly shown that duloxetine is the only drug which has uh, shown some evidence to be effective in patients from C with CIPN, and as well as uh, it has also at doses of 60 milligram per day, and that's quite a high dose. And uh, there, it has also shown promise in patients who have are the um, aromatase inhibitor induced musculoskeletal syndromes where two out of three patients have good relief of pain. However, in this group, there has been some intolerable side effects as well. So it's still not recommended for use in this, but for CIPN, yes, duloxetine is the drug of choice. Uh, if you look at the summary of evidence for uh, use of adjuvants in cancer survivors, duloxetine is the only one which has dropped a caused a significant reduction and uh, that is what is recommended. But if you look at it, the arrest, other drugs are also being used like gabapentinoids, venlafaxine, cannabinoids, amitriptyline and nortriptyline and so on. So what does ASCO have to say about that? Um, they suggest that gabapentinoids can be used. Basically, um, the studies on gabapentinoids in non-cancer patients is extrapolated to this situation and uh, one can use it. But having said that, gabapentinoids produce sedation, somnolence, uh, headache, and so on. And uh, these patients, survivors, are now trying to get back to normal. So you don't want uh, them get their lifestyle getting hampered by these drugs, especially since they may have not have to drive. They should not be driving, should not be... Uh, operating machinery which can interfere with their uh, 
professions as well. What about NMDA receptor antagonists like ketamine and magnesium? Um, there's not much on uh, use of ketamine in uh, survivors, neither uh, is there enough data on magnesium. However, according to the ASCO guidelines, one can use these. It entirely depends upon the clinician. The efficacy and the long-term effectiveness is not established, but we presume maybe the benefit would be there, so you could use it if you intend to. Now, coming to topical analgesics. Um, in this subset of patients, the survivors, uh, there is a recommendation for use of topical analgesics, though uh, there are very few studies uh, which are heterogeneous, but it's entirely up to the clinical discussion because the harm is far less than the possible benefit. Most of these work partly by get control as well. So you have different creams, gels, sprays, patches, like of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like diclofenac, you have uh, local anesthetic lidoderm cream, 5%, which is used for patients with uh, persistent post-surgical pain, capsaicin, 8% cream for CIPN, baclofen, amitriptyllin, ketamine, and the work. So it, uh, it, this sort of, the best bit about it is not really absorbed. It's a local action, effective, and uh, patients can get on with their lives as well. Okay, but entire use depends upon your clinical description. Coming to cannabinoids. There's a lot of evidence which is coming on cannabinoids, especially from Canada, uh, but there's still insufficient evidence. But uh, so this, these data, uh, guidelines were uh, way back in 2016, so newer data in the next few months to years probably will have more new recent guidelines coming up uh, because cannabis is being used quite significantly in those countries. Uh, but still now, there is no evidence to suggest that it should be used as a first line. Yes, if patients have refractive pain conditions, cannabis could be used, but there's insufficient evidence to recommend one preparation over the other. As of India, we still are in the research mode. Even at Tata Memorial, we are going ahead with uh, cannabis trials, and hopefully in another year, we should be able to give, a, give some idea on, throw some light on the use of cannabis for cancer pain but not in survivors. Survivors will come much later after that. Coming to the fourth point, which ASCO has uh, emphasized upon, which is basically if you're going to prescribe opioids, strong opioids, you have to basically, uh, strong opioids are not to be used as a first line. And if you really have to administer it because there's no other option and you've maximally utilized your non-opioid and non-pharmacological approaches, then the first and foremost thing is to assess the risk, whether this patient is going to be at risk for addiction. But there are various uh, questionnaires available uh, which can be uh, administered to the patient to get an idea. Patients' relatives have to also be a part of this uh, discussion. They should understand the risks and the benefits of using strong opioids. They have to be, it has to be emphasized on them that drugs like sedatives as well as alcohol may not, should not be consumed along with this, make sure that uh, we have a stringent uh, dispensing method as well as checking method to ensure that there's no misuse or diversion of the drug. Okay, and uh, they have to be taught about how to store, use, and dispose these medicines. So this is a very important thing which has to be done in case opioids are to be administered to this subset of patients. So ASCO as well as NCCN. NCCN basically has, does not give guidelines for pain management per se. It mainly uh, focuses on sleep, anxiety, depression, and other aspects of um, in cancer survivors, which also to some extent helps in reducing the pain as well. But both ASCO and NCCN recommend the use of both pharmacological as well as non-pharmacological modalities for managing pain in these survivors. What are the non-pharmacological approaches? Basically neuromodulation, psychosocial interventions, and complementary and alternative medicine. By neuromodulation, you mean uh, peripheral nerve stimulators and spinal cord stimulators. They mainly work by gate control. So basically, if you implant the nerve, uh, uh, peripheral nerve stimulators close to the nerves, especially in has been used for uh, post-surgical pain and chronic radiation-induced neurot neuropathies as well. Uh, a small electric current is given to the nerves, which creates certain signals, which kind of 
inhibit the pain signals transmitted so as to block the pain symptoms, uh, pain signals completely. And spinal cord stimulators are inserted and um, they are used in chronic non-cancer pain and can be used to treat radiation-induced neuritis and CIPNS. So not, I, I don't have much experience in this. It had, this is from whatever the literature says. And uh, they work mainly by stimulating the dorsal columns to inhibit transmission of pain. Psychological therapy is extremely important. We all know that psychology plays a very important role in patients with chronic pain. So, so to, similarly, even in survivor, psychology will play an extremely important role. Chronic pain is a multidimensional phenomenon. So therefore, without a clinical psychologist helping you out, it becomes next to impossible to treat uh, quite a large number of these sort of patients because uh, there's enough evidence to suggest that uh, uh, patients who have uh, depression and anxiety have higher pain incidences and those who are, get back to normal life where are physically very active have much lower levels of pain. Uh, isolation and fatigue, sleep disturbances are also known to be associated with higher amount of pain. So most important in this is having a psychological support of the patient along with your non-opioid therapy and other options of treatment. Uh, this can be done by group programs where people are made to sit together, discuss about it, uh, voice out their problems, keep journals where they write it down, uh, strength training, aerobic exercises, and so on. Cognitive behavioral therapy plays a very important role. Similarly, as it does in uh, psychiatry, it also works very well in chronic pain and can also be used in survivors where they are made to learn to adapt to the pain and change their outlook. They use distraction therapy, relaxation, imagery, yoga, and so on as well. And this is not only used for patients, they can also be administered to caregivers because it helps to reduce stress and their distress so that they can actually cope better and patient can improve from there. Complementary and alternative medicine. There are, um, in addition to our uh, non opioid treatment and uh, the non pharmacological management, a large section of the non pharmacological management, which is recent, if you look at literature, even for cancer pain and post operative pain, a lot of uh, these alternative and complementary medical. Uh, management is getting more and more um, aggressive. People are looking towards this to kind of change the way and to minimize the use of uh, medications and so on. So basically, they have, there are several studies on um, mindfulness, um, uh, acupuncture, massage therapy, music therapy. There are certain RCTs which have supported the, the fact that hypnosis, acupuncture, and music therapy lower pain threshold, uh, lower the pain, sorry, increase pain thresholds and lower pain. But um, so basically these probably could work even in cancer survivors, minimizing uh, their distress. Uh, mindfulness, meditation, yoga and massage therapy are not shown to reduce pain per se, but they do reduce emotional distress. This is not from direct uh, cancer survivor data but from other data also which has been added on and but uh, emotional distress is one of the factors which is usually associated with pain so indirectly it can help lower pain as well so in conclusion as onco oncology as a stream is advancing we have millions of patients of cancer who are now living as survivors and a significant portion of them tend to be suffering from pain. Now, this pain cannot be treated with opioids alone because that becomes pro problematic. So best option is not to go ahead with opioids and they're not recommended. The main way of treating this sort of uh, pain in survivors is a multimodal approach using a multidisciplinary method and uh, using both uh, pharmacological and non-pharmacological methods uh, to give a more holistic care of the patient to the patient and help them to achieve good functionality. And this is exactly what both ASCO and NCCN have recommended for managing cancer survivors. Now, these are all the references which you can go through if you are interested, which will help you get into depths and cross references from where you could read further if interested.
thank you so much indeed for your patient listening. Thank you. I think Aparna, yeah. you have done a wonderful because the thing is, many times whenever we are talking about cancer and pain and all those things, we talk of only immediate pain management when the patient is in a advanced cancer and all. It's a very rare topic that is first time discussed where we spoke about the uh, cancer survivors. survivors. And, and the way you have spoken and you, the way you have covered it is amazing. Very good. Thank I you. Feel really proud. Any questions? Yeah. Any question from the audience who's hearing? Uh, no, sir, we haven't received any questions yet in the Q&A box. Okay. I can understand because the thing is many of the population is mainly interested in the non-cancer pain. There are very mm -hmm. few people who are really interested in the cancer pain. Cancer pain. Sure. So I'm really, I, I can agree with that, whatever it is, no question. And, that too, and cancer pain, that too in survivors, yeah, that's another group altogether. Say, I, I, I must say that this is the first time I heard something like pain in the cancer pain survivors. It's a very good topic you have covered. And I think you covered a lot. And I have seen that in such patients, mainly the complementary medicine, psychotherapy, <laughs> And all those things can carry a lot of uh, importance instead yeah. of giving opiates are not been preferred. But one more thing is there, I should say, I should add that it has been seen, for example, if a patient is having a post mastectomy pain syndrome and all those things. In such patient, to take care of initial thing, we have to give a multiple blocks also of mm -hmm. a local anesthetic with a steroid so that we can break the chain of symptoms and pain. It takes about uh, maybe uh, 15 days to one month for you to give a break about, I mean, every third week or for I mean, every third day or fifth day, you can give the block. You have to repeat five to seven block. And it works there after very well. Or also, there are also seen that if patient has got a uh, post mastectomy pain syndrome or even a lymphedema. In such condition, it has been seen that we can give a plaster, which is a, a MJ Super plaster that has been worked very nice in the good old days. Nowadays, they are not been using, but otherwise, there are compression bandages and all those things also work very well. So that the initial part of the severity of the pain is being taken care of. Yeah, we've been using lidoderm patches as well for yes. first, uh, persistent post-surgical pain seems to work. So we don't have a study at the moment, but plan to do one soon. Uh, ma'am, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we have received one question. I have posted in the chat box, ma'am. Parmanan Jain has questioned yeah, you. Jain sir has asked, do you think the use of facial plane blocks? Uh, can it be red? I mean, I can't open this. Yeah. Can you do please you think it? the use of newer facial pain plane blocks help in decreasing persistent post-surgical pain in cancer survivors? Uh, I don't have much experience in the use of facial plane blocks in cancer survivors, but yes, I'm sure using steroid injections instead of just in combination with the local anesthetics like we do for a lot of non-cancer patients, uh, I'm sure it would make a difference. At least help to break the circuit of pain and help to minimize the severity. Like we do for uh, uh, patients with post thoracotomy pain, we do give local anesthetics, we give steroids. So even facial plane blocks, I'm sure because of the same on the same lines would work. So there's no harm trying. This basically prevents in post-surgical pain also. Absolutely. Chronic post-surgical pain can be prevented and that ultimately goes into account for your relief in the post-operative period. Post period. And long-term pain. Even in survivors, if such sort of pains come in, you can inject the steroids. Like even, and, uh, I mean, uh, patients with uh, uh, CRPS, don't we inject uh, stellate ganglion steroid and local anesthetic? We do. So similarly, even with uh, these sort of patients, facial plane blocks surely would work. Yeah, uh, yes, Dr. Garg, about lignocaine and ketamine. Yeah, they, if you look at Cochrane reviews, they say there's not really much in that. But clinically, when we do use, yes, in certain patients, especially with neuropathic pain, though it's not my first line of management, 
second, third line ketamine infusions and uh, all lignocaine infusions are, have shown promise with uh, the pain severity coming down. I'm sure Dr. Gedu could also add to it or Dr. Jain could add to it as well. <laughs> no, the thing is what we also do is whenever, for example, if a patient is like the way you said that we should not continue the opiate therapy also for a long time. Mm -hmm. But suppose patient has been on the opiate therapy for a long time, they do become an addict and although so in such condition also, the giving of ketamine and all definitely makes to break down the chain between the opiates and all those things. So that is also one of the good way where you can give even subcutaneous or even the orals also it will be used for that. Yeah, we give ketamine or lignocaine infusion on three separate days. I call them for three days and give the infusion yes. so to break the circuit. Correct. And then uh, the pain does come down. We are able to reduce the amount of dose of uh, opioids and other medication. But this is, I've seen in patients, uh, some post thoracotomy patients also, we've had to do this. And uh, it's mainly the whatever uh, experience I have of ketamine and lignocaine is in cancer pain patient, not in survivors. But yes, I'm sure that can be applied to them. Any other questions? Any questions from anyone? I think, uh, Rupsa, is there any question? Rupsa, any questions from the participants? Uh, no, ma'am. Till now, there is no question. Okay. Okay, any comment, Anjali? Anjali, do you have any question or any comment? And that I really wanted to say was that I'm glad uh, um, you suggested this topic yourself, Aparna. Uh, I think this was uh, absolutely not discussed in any of the sessions that I have attended. As Dr. Yeah, Gedu already said, it is a very rare topic. And thank you for um, telling us all how it uh, impacts the entire life of the patient, both the disease and the therapy, and uh, how it affects all aspects of uh, the patient's life and his work and everything. It was beautifully brought out. Along with, uh, thanks for sharing your own experiences as well. You know, I think uh, Tata does quite a bit of um, yeah. research in this field. Yeah, we're increasing so it now. That as well. We're increasing it significantly now. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Anjali. Does Dr. Garg want to say anything? Yes, Dr. Garg. Madam has already Hello, answered it, uh, whatever I want to ask. <laughs> Hello. Hello. It was uh, an absolutely wonderful session. Uh, ma'am, very sorry to interrupt you, ma'am, but uh, we have received two questions. Can yeah. Yes. okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, okay, sir. So I'm pasting that in the chat box. Radio frequency modulation. Is, this is radio frequency modulation, modulation, particularly had a neck carcinoma survival, like medullary or mandibular nerve. Radio frequency modulation. Radio frequency. I I have personally not much experience in radio frequency. I don't do it. I so if anybody it. else could add to it, uh, Doctor Gar, Doctor Gedo, anyone? Yeah, I uh, can say that I agree with her because in Tata Memorial Hospital mainly we hardly do any radio frequency. We always go with a. Neurolytic blocks, which is whether it is head neck, yeah, whether it is head neck cancer or whatever it is, we yeah. prefer to go for a neurolytic block. There are two reasons. One thing, one is very important that the patient is already been completely exhausted financially because you have undergone surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and coming from a remote area where you don't have that much. So giving a neurolytic block is much more, much more cheaper. So that's the best option that is available, and it's an easier option instead of giving. Neuromodulation, not which is I very think the uh, Gedu, sir, but the person who's asked this question, I think, are looking forward to the use of radio frequency modulation for can head neck cancer patients who have survived without the disease. So, yeah. like yeah. maxillary and, uh, and maxillary, I'm sure it can be done. 
So we are using uh, radio frequency ablation for uh, mm. persistent pains in these patients. <clears throat> we go for maxillary, mandibular, and glossopharyngeal nerve block. Mm. Uh, radio frequency ablation we use pulse wave, uh, pulse radio frequency ablation, and usually uh, they give a good uh, uh, time frame for <clears throat> good pain relief, almost uh, three to six months. So since uh, financial mm. issues are not a concern, uh, being a government sponsored center. So we quite frequently use it and it is giving a good response to the patient. Okay. It can be done. I do not know about the modulation word, but ablation we do use. Ablation. <laughs> and immunotherapy related pain in survivors have already spoken of. Basically, the neuropathic pain as well as the different type of arthralgias, myositis and uh, uh, muscle pain, with, mainly because of uh, autoimmune sort of a picture. So... That's exactly what happens. Many of these new immunotherapy patients come with severe body aches. All of almost all of them are on paracetamolities. Uh, this is uh, this was by Dr. Aragya Mukherjee. I hope uh, we are able to answer his reply. And immunotherapy was uh, by Dr. Brian Jackson. Anything more, Rupsa? Uh, no, ma'am, not yet. Your session was so exhausting, ma'am. I, I, I don't think... <laughs> I think Dr. Jain also wanted your opinion on the, whether the trade-off of immunotherapy and uh, the side effects is worth it. Sorry, I can you play, repeat that? Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. a good question, ma'am. Uh, nutritional hmm. deficiency related chronic pain. I think a very good question. And hmm. Nutritional? Where is the question? I don't see it. Oh, nutritional deficiency related chronic pain. That's interesting. Yeah, sure. Vitamin D deficiency anyways causes a lot of chronic pain. Uh, vitamin B12 deficiency causes neuropathies. So yes, def nutritional deficiency plays an important role. And I'm sure though there's not much evidence or not much uh, study. It's not many studies into that aspect in cancer patients. I'm sure a lot of the pain would be added on to because of the nutritional deficiencies that they have during the course of their treatment and after. Um, I have never come across this only in cancer, but yes, uh, nutritional deficiency does cause a lot of pain. I think B12 deficiency is also one of the uh, issues seen with issues patients on chemotherapy. Neuropathy, so this... yeah, immunotherapy. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, uh, we have received one short comment. I have also pasted on the chat box. Okay. You should do serum levels before starting pain management. That would, be good. Yes. that would be good, yes. Do you do it at your place? Uh, sometimes when they are not uh, responsive to the initial line of management and we uh -huh. have a high index of suspicion, it would, but I think it's, it's not a routine. It's not a routine. Yeah, we don't do unless it's necessary. And, uh, and many a times, other than us, the medical oncology team would have done quite a few of them. So we get the, this thing, but if they are low, then we do add. But by ourselves, we've never prescribed any investigations unless required. There are no questions and uh, we are just three minutes left. We are absolutely on time. Yeah. So we request Gedu said to say thanks to Madam for our wonderful session. Oh, no, I already said that she has spoken a very nice topic and it was a rare discuss. First time I heard on cancer survivor pain and all those things. And I think she covered a fairly good aspect, almost all aspects that have been very important, I already told. And uh, I've touched on them. There's a lot more if you have to go into the index. That I would hope people who have been participants here would want to go through. Yeah, That's yeah. why I give the references. I'll be more delighted if in the future in case anything that is related to cancer is being discussed in this clear net and all those things. The people will take more interest so that people will really start enjoying the cancer pain related things because majority of them, as I told you already, they are non-cancer people, all package surrounding your vertebra. Nothing else. That is the real ground reality. But anyway, uh, Aparna, you have done a very lovely job. I can say. Thank you so much. Really indeed. happy, proud of you. You covered thank fairly you. all aspects. I should yeah, say. Thank you very much. Indeed.
And I should say thank you to you, sir. Uh, definitely to Madam Dr. Aparna, but thank you to you also for chairing this session. And uh, as usual, the SOPSI webinars levels academically are very high, and you coordinated with your all inputs, with all your comments, uh, and sparing time. And uh, I also thank all the participants who have been with us. Uh, their inputs are always good, and we learn from each other. And you have uh, you know, added on to the uh, new discussion part, which is again very useful. So I again thanks to all the uh, participants for today's webinar and join us on uh, subsequent webinars, OPSI webinar also, and flyer will be released soon on the various social media. Please do share it with your uh, group so that we can take advantage of the eminent speakers who are you know, coming up, just not the uh, evidence, but they are also sharing their experiences, uh, long experiences in anesthesia, and it's really uh, you know, fun and uh, Really good to learn from that. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so much, time. everyone, for extending Thanks. us the opportunity to host the session. So, with all Thanks. your permission, I would like to sign off here. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you. See ya. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Rupsa. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thanks, sir. Good night. Good night, all of you. Good night, everyone.